Well, good day, everyone, and welcome to another FS Club webinar. Uh, today, we're featuring uh, what we call Communities Chest, and I've got a dear friend of, of ours, uh, Brendan May. Uh, Brendan May, we've worked with over many years, uh, including uh, some very early days in the 90s at the Marine Stewardship Council. And Brendan heads up a Roberts Bridge Group, and we'll be going over uh, their work and what they do uh, later on as we go through uh, Brendan's uh, uh, Brendan's life, if I might, uh, to remind you folks, Communities Chest is a, an opportunity really for people in our community to air what they're doing, what they're what they're up to, and even to get round to uh, asking us to help. Uh, so um, I just want to begin, if I might, with thanks to our sponsors. There's a copious list of sponsors here, and obviously we're always happy to have more. Uh, but what is great about our sponsors, all of them, is that they let us range widely over technology and finance and uh, economics and social purpose. And Brendan exemplifies many of those things today in his unique ability to knit together uh, the, the structures of normal commerce with achieving social goals. Uh, the agenda today is um, fairly straightforward. Uh, we are going to have a little bit of background on our guest, give it a color if we can. Uh, then we're going to move to what's the top of the in-tray, what, what strikes Brendan's funny bone, uh, and then we're going to move on to four themes that Brendan and I have uh, set out together. So I'm slightly prepared and you're not, but we'll come to those in a moment. Uh, and then Brendan's going to give us a kind of an ask, what can we do to help? So uh, I'll just start, Brendan, if I might. Um, I was thinking to myself about you know what might be your biggest hero. And I recall a conversation, I think it was uh, in the West End at a fish restaurant, or, uh, what else would you expect, Sheikis, I believe, uh, where you outlined something I had no idea, which was your passion for Leonard Bernstein. Mm. Indeed, there's my piano behind me and a picture of him behind me. So even though that was 20 years ago, it still um, applies, yeah. I love music, uh, but I, I, love, um, I love world citizens. He was a real world citizen and an educator and a campaigner and also an all-round musician, so a bit of everything, a bit of, bit of West Side Story, conducting, playing, teaching, tangle word, teaching kids in, in field. I, I love all that. But you wanted to make a film, didn't you? I did. I, I even had a little storyboard for a biopic of him, and I, I abandoned it. And now uh, I think both Martin Scorsese and Bradley Cooper are, in fact, doing it, but it's not my film, unfortunately. Well, I hope they do as good a job as you would have. <laughs> I, I love your passion for, for Bernstein. Uh, um, another thing I, I thought, and probably a little bit more commercial, but uh, very important, I think, for our audience to understand um, the crucial role of the Marine Stewardship Council in fish, but also your important role. I, I think you started there in 94, 95, something like that. 98. Um, 98. Okay. And maybe could you just outline uh, you know, what was so important about the Happy Ticky Fish Mark? Well, it was interesting because it was one of the very early green business partnerships. So it had been set up by Unilever, who were then the world's largest buyer of frozen seafood before they sold their fish brands, uh, and WWF, World Wildlife Fund. And it was modeled on the Forest Stewardship Council, which was a little bit older. Uh, but this idea of market incentives, certification, labels to encourage better sustainability in particular commodities was still very new then. Uh, and it was particularly new to the, to the fisheries industry, which had been a, a notoriously kind of intransigent sector. And it came really out of the sudden collapse of the Grand Bank's uh, Canadian cod fishery in, in Newfoundland which forced Unilever and others to think, where is the fish going to come from? Um, and the science there was a bit of a ticking time bomb. So it's quite an apt metaphor for what's going on more globally now with the climate. Very true. Well, you changed my life, that's for sure, because I wound up giving a series of lectures at Gresham College in the 2000s. Uh, and then I took all of those lectures in a big bundle and handed them to my business colleague, Ian Harris, and said, turn that into a book. Uh, and the book is called The Price of Fish. So without you, I, I don't think we would have gotten that deeply involved in the subject. Um, but it's achieved a heck of a lot. I mean, it's well over 10% of certification, oh, sorry, 10% of wild fish are now certified as sustainable. We see the logo everywhere, uh, particularly on the continent and a lot of the German retail outlets. Uh, here in the UK, I think Waitrose and many other, uh, the, many other uh, stores are absolutely committed to it. Isn't that correct? It is. It's become uh, very, very scalable. Uh, big commitments by McDonald's and Walmart and 
others. Um, and it's beset by the same controversies that it was when I was there. Uh, so the, the problem with all of these certification systems is the producers believe the bar is set too high uh, and that it's unfair and that the, the, the standards are too stringent. And the campaigners and the NGOs think the bar is set way too low. And how can you possibly give a, an eco label to something that uh, you know, has bycatch in it or that catches too many fish or whatever it may be? And uh, these debates rage on and they rage on in all certification systems. It's not just uh, fisheries. I always used to say, you know, it's the worst job in the world in a sense, because being the head of one of these organizations, you end up in the middle of the road with all the other roadkill. You're, ju you're sort of doing your job properly if everybody hates you in equal measure. Mm, yeah, I, I do remember chairing a couple of uh, large conclaves, uh, one I think at the Methodist Church, uh, sorry, the Methodist Hall, and uh, yeah, you do feel in the middle. Now, that's been a, an extremely successful approach, though. I mean, while MSC wasn't the first, it was early. I think we also had the Soil Association, iPhone for the organic movement. But now this whole uh, certification idea has spread. Uh, and a lot of that was you using uh, economics and finance appropriately to achieve a social purpose. And you've gone really now to set up uh, what well, Robert's Bridge has been going quite some time now. Could you tell the audience a little bit about that, please? Yeah, I set up uh, Roberts Bridge 10 years ago uh, this year uh, with a bunch of other like-minded former NGO leaders, people out of the sustainable business movement, uh, people who've been head of sustainability inside companies. And uh, we basically are there to change companies who want to embrace uh, the imperatives that are coming down the line. And often we have companies that want to change and meaningfully, but they don't really know how to. And they also don't really understand the ecosystem of the sustainability world, which is very complicated with you know, radical NGOs, pragmatic NGOs, and they don't really know how to communicate. So we do four things broadly. Um, one of the biggest areas of our work is doing the sustainability strategies and plans for companies. So we did the Heathrow plan, Heathrow 2.0. We did Sainsbury's 20 by 20. Last year, we did Ovo Energy's plan, which is called Plan Zero, which is all about net zero carbon. Uh, we do a lot of uh, relationship brokering with NGOs, activist groups, the sustainable development world, uh, helping companies navigate that landscape, communicate uh, with it. Uh, some communications, uh, reputation, risk management, uh, reactive communications. Uh, and also, um, we increasingly find ourselves doing mediation. So mediation when a very large company is being campaigned against very vociferously by a campaign group, might be Greenpeace, uh, might be Oxfam. And we actually go in and broker an agreement uh, between the company and, and, and the NGO, which involves both sides having to slightly compromise on their positions. Um, so, yeah, we are a critical friend to business. We're not there to endorse what they're doing particularly, but to tell them what, what, it, what, it, what leadership looks like in a fast changing world. Uh, you, you mentioned to me, and I was very impressed with the role that you have with Cargill. I was wondering if you could just explain to the audience that, because I think that exemplifies that mediation element. Cargill is very interesting because it's, it, I think it is still the, word, the world's largest privately held company, and it is the world's largest food uh, ingredient business by some margin. And historically, that hasn't lent itself to the kind of um, transparency and openness that you would expect from, say, a Unilever. Uh, or an IKEA, and uh, there's quite a big cultural change going on in, in Cargill. And the idea of an independent advisory panel, which is quite common with listed companies, you know, Shell's had one uh, for years, so has Unilever, uh, has been quite new. So last year we launched uh, a land use and forest sustainability advisory panel, which looks at all the deforestation issues that Cargill faces, uh, palm oil, soy, cocoa, uh, all these commodities. And it's made up of NGOs, academics, uh, national representatives, a couple of Brazilian representatives, which is very important on the soy debate. Yeah. And what's important, I think, is two things. One is that the chief executive of Cargill attends the meeting uh, because that's a sign of seriousness, uh, real seriousness. This is not a corporate affairs or a communications. Uh, mm -hmm. And also we publish our minutes on the Cargill website so they can see what criticism is being made of the company. It's a very important step for corporate accountability uh, and also, I think, a, a body that can provide valuable insights and constructive criticism 
uh, to a company as large as Cargill in a public way. Very impressive. Um, got, a, got a small question before we move on to the next slide. It's uh, from Rupert Stubbs in West West London, i.e. Bristol. Uh, he's interested in what uh, your thoughts might be on the Ellen MacArthur Foundation support of encouraging circularity in business. Is that better or different than just sustainability? Absolutely. So the the you know when I started in all this you know twenty years ago, it was all about um, mitigating or reducing environmental impacts. Uh, this thinking of closed loop. Uh, recycling and upcycling and circular economy is, is much is much newer. It's not that new, but it's newer. And um, it is uh, Ellen MacArthur's work in this area. They, they are the kind of go-to organisation on, on circularity. Accenture as well. They've done a lot of work uh, on this. Uh, it's quite a specialised niche uh, area. It's not it's not one that we've done very much in actually. Uh, a lot of our work has been commodities, deforestation, sustainable agriculture. Um, energy, carbon, climate. Um, but yeah, Alan MacArthur's organization uh, is, I would say, the engine room of a lot of the best thinking on this. Uh, and it makes sense to be approaching the economy in that way. Uh, it's nice to hear that the thinking keeps moving forward. Um, so um, I wanted to ask you just, you know, what's the most thought provoking thing you've seen lately? Well, you said thought provoking, surprising, or funny. And actually, this. I the example I've chosen actually hits all three uh, okay. because I do find it both funny and thought provoking and also surprising. And that is, you know, since I've known you in the what, late 90s, I've spent, and we've often discussed the role of government in all this, and, and it's rather, um, uh, should we say, less than stellar role in <laughs> sorting out these problems. But I have, um, I've spent 20 years listening to people saying, Oh, you can't really do anything about the climate. It's too difficult. The politics are too difficult. There isn't really enough money. Um, you know, the voters don't really care about it. And I, I've listened to this quite patiently for two decades. And then I watched them shut down Italy in an evening. And I watched the whole world go into lockdown in a three week period, yeah. mandated by government, no mucking around. <laughs> a bit of mucking around here, but in most countries, no mucking around. And suddenly, money for furlough schemes to bail out the aviation sector, bail out the hotel industry. Now, I know this is an emergency and it's a pandemic and it's unusual. And, well, is it unusual? You said you've been doing newsletters about pandemics for years. But the truth is, it has absolutely obliterated the argument that we can kind of go slowly, slowly and that the money will move eventually and the voters will move eventually. The climate emergency is as serious, but its consequences will be way worse uh, and far longer lasting. And the next time I hear a government say, oh, we can't really change the subsidy arrangement for this to move into clean technology because we've got a lot of uh, coal still to burn or a lot of oil, I don't think anybody will take it seriously because it is patently untrue. If government wants to do it, they will do it, just like they wanted to put a man on the moon in 1969. They did it. So I think it's surprising because suddenly, whoa, oh, well, there is money. You know, we can't give nurses a pay rise, but there's money to, you know, pay people their salaries for four months. Um, it's thought provoking because I think, and we'll talk about COVID, I know more in a minute, that it's really changed attitudes around public good. Um, and I find it quite funny because people are still making the case that we don't really have the um, ability to act on the climate emergency. It's a ridiculous argument. Mm. Yeah, well, I was reading an article recently that the uh, Londoners are sleeping a lot more because it's quiet, they're not going out at night, better sleep, and therefore much more dreaming, getting the, the tail end of the sleep where the dreams come through. And I think we're all dreaming of magic money trees and finding out that they really exist. So uh, anyway, um, just to provide a teensy bit of structure, which, uh, uh, when you and I uh, had our bit of a warm up, we were, we were discussing kind of how would we uh, handle things. And the suggestion really was that we, went back to Donald Rumsfeld and filled in his blanks. He really only talks about three of these. He doesn't talk about the unknown knowns. But most importantly, and this goes back to your point about pandemics, uh, what are the ignored knowns? Or as uh, somebody pointed out to me, there's a phrase out there called black elephants. So we know the elephants in the room, but we almost deliberately uh, not just ignore it, but black it out. So pandemics uh, would feature there. Uh, without question, climate change uh, would feature there. Uh, and uh, we'll lead on, really, if I might, then. We, we, we spoke really about uh, four of these ignored nodes, and then we have a sort of a fifth question at the end. 
So uh, I think the first one uh, to maybe talk about was one you thought was very interesting. What does George Floyd's step mean for brands and their positioning? Yeah, and what an intro to it, because you just actually used the phrase black elephant, and it reminds me of what uh, Muhammad Ali said years ago on Michael Parkinson. Is Why is God white? Why are the angels white? Why is everything good white? Why is pure white? You know, are the blacks in the kitchen making the milk and honey? And, you know, this event uh, in the, in the, that happened last month is quite a seminal moment. It's not the first time, because we had the, the Copernic kneeling a couple of years ago, and of course the, the um, injustices suffered by uh, racial minorities go back decades, more, hundreds of years. But um, this has ignited the debate about racial equality again in a way that was quite unexpected. And the reason I think it's significant is you can't be neutral anymore. So the, all, in the old days, companies, oh, it's not really our role to have a position on this. You know, gun control is another one. Uh, we, you know, we, we just sell pet food, you know, <laughs> and it's, um, you can't get away with that anymore. And it always reminds me of Desmond Tutu's quote, you know, if you're neutral in situations of injustice, you've chosen the side of the oppressor. And I think that this episode uh, is smoking out uh, already companies that are not planning to do anything about this and, and bringing to the fore companies that are. So Patagonia has removed its ads from Facebook because they don't believe Facebook is policing uh, hate uh, sufficiently in the ads that you're allowed to post on Facebook. There was an extraordinary episode where uh, a member of the public tweeted Yorkshire Tea saying, so glad that my favorite tea brand hasn't jumped on this ridiculous Black Lives Movement bandwagon. And Yorkshire Tea, quick as a flash, wrote back saying, I'm afraid we don't want you to buy our tea, if that's your view. And then, and then the consumer said, well, I'm going to buy PG Tips then. And then PG Tips, which is owned by Unilever, tweeted back from its account saying, sorry, you won't be able to buy our tea either if you're a racist. We don't want you as a customer. And this is, you know, this is quite uh, interesting to watch. So companies having to take position. And some people think it's opportunistic. Some people think it's virtue signaling. I don't think so. I, I don't like this phrase, virtue signaling. What do they want us to do? Signal vice? Signal evil? Mm. Um, it's brought this uh, this very real uh, issue back into the boardroom. And I listened to the chief executive of one of our clients uh, moments after this all happened in Minneapolis saying this is going to change forever how we in our company approach racial equality. That this has thrown uh, the door open on a great ugliness in our society, which can no longer be hidden or brushed under the carpet. And I think that's a very good thing. But I think companies that don't proactively respond to this are going to lose the support of all but a very kind of redneck audience. Well, one of our viewers has helped me out. Apparently, the hashtag is solidarity. S-O-L-I-D-A-R-I-T-E-A, -E which I think is very cute. Um, uh, just, just to, before we move on to the next question, um, one, one of our viewers is wondering, is this uh, an extension of the concept of communities? So it, it, funnily enough, I, I would argue in the business to business market, uh, you're often defined by who your customers are. There's a bit of a community there. So law firms that act on behalf of certain types of clients, folk and others, and or seem to have positions, um, you, try, you try and ensure to some degree that you are uh, really making your community a good one. Um, but we've tended on the consumer side to say, I don't know, you know, somebody bought it and they take it away, uh, whether they're a mass murderer or, you know, a child molester. Do you, um, do you see this as the natural extension that the community as a brand is moving forward? I, I do, and I think it extends that there's a kind of cluster of these issues. It's not only uh, about black black lives, it's not only about race, it's gender, it, uh, um, uh, you know, um, gay, gay and bisexual trans issues, you know, the trouble that J.K. Rowling got into recently, uh, and that the body shop was sucked into that because they sent her a tweet and everybody accused the, the body shop of being... Um, phobic about people who suffered abuse. I mean, it can all get incredibly complicated. And actually, the trans debate is one that I, I, I haven't fully understood the issues, but it's, it's coming and brands are being sucked into it. And it's a very, very sensitive debate. 
so yeah, there are commu there are communities, and, and it all plays into one of our later topics, which is the polarization of global politics, which I think uh, is going to fuel more of this. You know, it's kind of you need to get off the fence. Okay. Well, moving on then. Um, you know, you you know the, the surprising thing has been a government's reaction to COVID, but is it a game changer really, or are we deluding ourselves? So we'll go back to our old habits pretty fast. And what should the new habits be? Um, I think it's a delusion to think this is in some way going to slow the climate emergency because nobody's been on a plane for four months, or that the presence of you know dolphins in canals in Venice means that nature is healing and everything's going to be just fine because all these species are miraculous. You know, we see you know herds of, herds of wild boar wandering around Cannes and all that stuff, and it makes for great Twitter. But uh, this is not even going to touch the sides in terms of the extinction and, and climate emergency. But I do think, yes, um, so the concept of the office, with, uh, Robertsbridge has never had an office in 10 years. The concept of the office is going to change. It's quite hard, I think, to imagine offices other than you know where it's essential, like call centers, five days a week in an office, nine to five. I think that uh, is very much up for grabs. Um, what pointless work travel, so that trip you know, to Munich or Frankfurt for a day long conference, you know, a marketing meeting in Rome and back on the same day. This is clearly unnecessary uh, as the technology we're using right now um, shows. And companies are saving a lot of money on travel. You know, our clients are saving money on me not traveling. I travel a lot uh, and I haven't been able to go anywhere. Um, I think people have engaged more in their local communities, um, definitely, looking out for, for neighbors and so on. I think our concept of public goods has changed. So suddenly the health service and social care services is very much in the spotlight. And, you know, your private health insurance is no use to you in COVID because if you get COVID and you need a ventilator, you're not going to a private hospital, you're going to the NHS. Uh, and so I think the concept of what kind of public services are we investing in and, what, and, and are we investing enough in them has, has become much more acute than the kind of distinction between laissez-faire, I'm all right, Jack, I've got my private provision, and it's right that I have my private provision because it needs the NHS for poor people. I don't think, I think we're going to have to rethink some of that. Um, and then there is uh, the enormous linkage that is not new science, but there'll be a lot more of it uh, between pandemics, zoonotic diseases, and how we are treating nature. And that is in relation to land use, land use change, agricultural practices, uh, pesticides, deforestation, conversion, density of livestock, chemicals used, runoff waste, uh, cloning, uh, animal nutrition ingredients, uh, live markets, all of these things. Uh, and the science is not new, but now already I'm hearing that companies are going to be looking more closely at their own supply chains in relation to this stuff and commissioning their own science. And I initially thought this is going to be a free pass uh, and companies are going to say, oh, you don't understand, we can't really do all this now because the cost of COVID is so big, you know, we've got to focus on that. It is not happening. People are using it to step up, not step down. Well, I've got a couple of questions that are related to this point, um, although we'll need to be snappy. Uh, Christopher Gleedel is asked, what do you say to people who hear most often from those in the most influential positions about the setting of a strategy, uh, for example, for sustainability or a circular economy, but see the tactics are missing or so fragmented that the integration of hard and soft systems doesn't work? So at best, this is all suboptimal. So strategy without tactics is the slowest route to victory. Sun Tzu, he quotes, but um, isn't there a lot of hypocrisy about? Um, not, not really in companies that are leading the charge. I mean, companies that are doing it properly have very, very detailed time-bound targets uh, and accountability mechanisms and delivery partners for achieving those targets. So, it, it, you know, the, the days where companies say, yeah, our goal is, you know, in 2050 to be a carbon-positive business with nothing in the data set or the, or the target mechanisms to back that up. Those those plans don't fly anymore. They probably did for 10 years. But not, I don't, don't see that particularly. I think the tactics are becoming ever more important. Well, your cargo example is an extremely good one. Uh, Edwina Morton uh, asks, and she's, she's really getting back to the previous question on Black Lives Matter, but I think it equally applies to 
COVID or, or sustainability. Some activists are criticizing companies for reacting to Black Lives Matter, accusing them of simply jumping on the bandwagon for their own purposes. Can companies win in these circumstances? Yeah, I, th I think I think the company can win if it's an authentic leadership position. So I was very struck walking past Coots in the Strand, I think it was two years ago, that you know how they, they dedicate their front office space on the street to causes. And they did this unbelievable display about the number of migrants who died died in the in the Mediterranean. You know, this was at the height of the, oh, of the, yeah. of the migrant crisis. I mean, it's not really what you'd expect a private bank like Coots to be doing, but it was very powerful, and they they do the same for Pride Month and so on. I think if it is if it is genuinely felt and critically, if the company's policies on, for example, diversity uh, stack up to the rhetoric, then I think it's legitimate. I think if it's a quick bandwagon. Um, you know, uh, exercise that gets smoked out very quickly. But for companies who are doing it properly, it isn't. Well, moving on to the next question, uh, you came up with this one on Russian roulette, and I tried to dig out an image. Uh, believe it or not, uh, I'm not sure it's played that often, but it is played. It is a, a game of Russian roulette in America using tasers. So this is a supposedly a live photo. Um, but you were going to make some more pointed remarks, uh, particularly to this audience, about the financial services system. Yeah, so, um, I mean, there's been a lot of work done in the city on sustainable finance, and you have led much of that work yourself uh, over the last decade. Uh, and there's a lot of, there's, there's some very good companies uh, doing very interesting work. But in general, I think it's a bit like certification. It, it's touched about 5 to 10% of, of, of the sector. And there's such limit, it goes back to Rumsfeld's unknown unknowns. People don't know what questions to ask or what they're looking for. So if, um, if, if an aim listed, you know, new company with a new mine somewhere in, in Africa, you know, is looking for finance, most people don't know what questions to ask. And they tend to go, oh, yeah, no, it's all fine. Absolutely. Yeah, no, local community loves this. And yeah, yeah, we've got a great NGO partner. And then you look under the bonnet or five years later, you know, it all explodes. Um, and then, you know, you're, the, the value of your investment is heavily compromised. Because it may be vulnerable to litigation, which is very expensive. It may be vulnerable to the campaigns. You know, you shouldn't really invest now in fossil fuels because they're going to be stranded assets. Everybody's getting the hell out of them, from BP to the Norwegian Pension Fund to everybody else. Mm. Uh, the the um, uh, Reserve Bank of Australia has, has said that if we don't act urgently on climate, we're going to wipe 25% off glo global GDP, and it's done that in cahoots with a number of other central banks around the world. Um, if you're going to invest in stuff that's grown in rainforests, you probably don't want it on peatland, which is oxidizing and sinking into the sea and has a limited number of rotations left on it. Um, you don't want an investment that is absolutely mired in social conflict and land rights disputes. Um, and so I think, you know, and, and property, you know, 30-year mortgages in the U.S. are now up for grabs in coastal areas because they don't know if the property is still going to be on the land in 30 years' time. It may be in the sea. So I think there's a, I think there's a lot of misunderstanding. I think some of the certification systems out there don't really deliver the answer to these questions. So I think, um, I, I, I think there are a number of risks that still in that sector they are not fully understood, uh, and they can be quite costly errors. Well, it's interesting because there's a question here from Dapo, which I think relates exactly to this point, but uh, about academia. Um, and he's saying academia is very influential about how students coming to the market expect business to behave. I remember my professional students assuming business did not care about the environment. Um, and I, I must say, personally, I, I, I have been stunned at how this uh, academic business divide is uh, almost perpetuating uh, myths and rumors which don't accord with the world as I see it which is nuanced. I'm not claiming businesses saintly or anything. I just mean they do care, as you've just indicated. Yeah, and it's going to be harder and harder to recruit the best graduates. I mean, nobody wants to go and work for a company that's on the front page of the Sunday Times, you know, for, for human rights abuses or for environmental destruction. Um, they've got a lot more choice now, and they are a lot more discerning. And the next generation that's coming is even more so. I mean, my, my kids are five and seven. And they, they know more about plastic pollution than some of the people I've worked with for 10 years. Yeah. Well, that moves us nicely on. The, the youth uh, who are, it's always 
protest has almost always been a, a youth thing, um, and this has been no exception. And protests on a variety of subjects, but definitely um, the, the notion of equality and definitely the notion of sustainability are right up there. And I too have a active active children in in this. So, what state is the NGO campaign movement in? Uh, and in fact, before I uh, before I uh, let you rip, rip out on it, I've already got a comment on that. Uh, from Ian, Ian uh, from St. David's, uh, who is moving to Dingle in Ireland, um, is asking, social media might be helping bring key issues to the fore, uh, but also might be a force for divisiveness. On balance, does Brendan think social media at the moment is a force for good or bad? And do you think regulation could help make it more of a force for good and less of a force for bad? So maybe you can take that into account as you open on this one. Yeah, well, on, on that latter point, uh, I mean, it can be both, uh, uh, and certainly the, the movement built by the likes of Greta Thunberg and, and Extinction Rebellion, whatever you think of them, have been a very effective use of social media. Uh, and of course, the, the ability of all of us to be citizens, so those powerful videos you see, uh, we, we saw them yesterday, of all the crap left on Bournemouth Beach, you know, oh. for the heat wave uh, COVID festival they had there on Wednesday and Thursday. It's very powerful stuff, um, and um, but uh, the menace of it, uh, you know, we've got we live in a world now where the president of the United States' tweets have to come often now with a marker saying this tweet may violate violate our policy on inciting violence, and they have to mark Trump's tweets uh, with a warning. So this is this is not good, and Facebook in particular has been long criticised for being far too lax in, in, in the kind of white supremacist and hate messages that it allows to circulate, and also the private messages on those functions. So, you know, it can be a force for good and bad, but there's huge pressure now on these companies, and the, the way to exert the pressure is companies like Patagonia pulling their advertising. Uh, so take the revenue away, and it'll force them to change. The campaigning movement and NGO movement in general is in a very poor state, um, and it has been for a long time. And part of it is because these NGOs, who are in no sense a homogenous blob, you can't say NGOs in general, so different to each other, but by and large they've had an identity crisis, which is are they activist campaigners or are they business consultancies? And um, you know, fundraising and marketing has for too long dominated conservation on the ground and policy making. And so some of the NGOs have really become, you know, you know their logo, you nice website, three pounds a month to save a, a, a panda or whatever it might be. Um, but they don't actually do any work on the ground. And I think the inertia in the NGO movement is, is what has given oxygen and energy to these kind of pop up flash mob movements like Greta Thunberg's climate strike movement mm -hmm. and Extinction Rebellion. Now, and I think, by the way, those movements have been enormously helpful in raising awareness. I know that the chief executive of Ovo Energy decided to bring us in to do a sustainability plan, partly because he walked past the Extinction Rebellion protests near the Ovo headquarters in Notting Hill. And so it is a powerful movement. The problem is they have no solutions. And, you know, Greta Thunberg is the first to say, I'm not qualified to tell companies what they should be doing. Uh, Extinction Rebellion, forget it, you know, in terms of in terms of solutions. Yeah. But um, I think that, um, you know, in terms of the bigger NGOs, Eric Hoffer said, every great um, cause begins as a movement, becomes a business and ends up as a racket. And I love that quote, because it's kind of what's happened to some of the, the bigger clunky old NGOs. Um, and I think that too much of the NGO movement still is about the problem. But where is the solution? Um, and with COVID and the economic doom and gloom that's coming, the other thing to, to factor in is that they will face a financial crisis of their own because a lot of their funding comes from foundations, which is based on share value and so on. And a lot of that value may have been wiped off. So the, the activist movement is fragmented. I think the future is very much in these social media driven hashtag driven movements so there have been tons of ngos campaigning on race for years but you create a hashtag called black lives matter it, it's very clear or the me too movement very clear 
Well, you know, even even I think it was uh, six, eight weeks ago, The Economist ran an article before the George Floyd uh, tragedy that uh, basically said, is uh, Black Lives Matter uh, at a dead end? Uh, so, you know, interesting how, how these things change. And I think you make a good point about distinguishing uh, the type of NGOs. Uh, I remember Michael Crichton wrote a book called State of Fear, uh, and it, it was a typical Crichton thriller. And unfortunately, I think he picked climate change as his... Uh, as his area, but the, the actual thrust of it was that the NGO movement seems to really have only uh, one tool in the bag, and that is uh, fear. Um, and you know, it's interesting to see, you know, how do we pick up a more positive negative uh, narrative? Uh, uh, one of our commentators here, Rupert, is saying, you know, sustainability. Why is it so rarely presented as an efficiency rather than just as a cost? Um, so it's how, how do we get these positive ma- narratives? whilst allowing these movements to express the emotion uh, that society is there, which helps to signal to business uh, you know, what, what, what people are valuing and how values are changing before they start changing in the marketplace. So, yeah. Well, um, we could go on for hours, but um, I, I thought we'd just move on to kind of your final question, um, if you don't mind. Uh, you know, and I think this will probably pick up some of the stuff from the previous four. Uh, what does the polarization of global politics mean for sustainability and corporate positioning? Yeah, this has been very interesting. So one of the, I guess, not not a fan of Donald Trump, but then I don't really know anyone who is. Uh, and one of the but one of the positive uh, bits of Trump is it, again, it's forced people to get off the fence, and it has spurred people into action which you don't get when you have a more moderate centrist uh, regime in place. And we've had that with Brexit here as well. So whatever your views on on Brexit, it has created in Britain a European movement that never really existed. We've never really had a pro-European movement in Britain. We've just kind of gone with being in the EU. And it's quite interesting. Again, companies have become associated with sides. So Weatherspoons, very much Brexit. Pimlico Plumbers, very much Remain. Um, and, you know, HSBC, I think about halfway through the Brexit stuff, you know, they ran some ads, Britain is not an island, you know, because their, their business depends on internationalism. Um, and I think as well, you know, if you look in Brazil, you know, Bolsonaro, very polarizing uh, figure. Uh, and it's presented some quite profound challenges for companies, because if you want to change farming in Brazil and you want to reverse rainforest destruction or dis- destruction in the in the Cerrado biome, you've got to carry the farmers with you. That's a bit of a problem at the moment because Bolsonaro's main electoral constituency is farmers. Um, and so if you are a non-Brazilian company operating in that very volatile political environment, you have to be quite careful to the cultural sensitivities of the audience that you're dealing with because it's not beyond the realm of imagination. Someone who fired the head of the Brazilian space agency because he didn't like the deforestation maps yeah. to say, uh, do you know what? Your company can get out of Brazil, thanks. Um, so this, this is quite, you know, serious geopolitics. Um, so I think it, it has a lot of implications. I mean, gun control, um, you know, it, when, when Trump, you know, uh, refuses to act on gun control, it brings the, the NRA very much into the spotlight and the NRA's funding of American politics. And suddenly Hertz and Avis are in the mix because they offer their car rental customers discounts if they're members of the NRA mm. and children being massacred in schools. It's not a good look. So I think um, I think it has its downsides, which is of course it's halted global climate progress and halted progress on so many things. But the upside is it's created movements which are there for when the pendulum swings back, and it will swing back because it yes. does. It's a very good point. Very good point indeed. We move on to the, the final segment in this uh, conversation. That I wish we had more time for. And that's uh, basically, Brendan, you know, we've got an audience out here. Uh, you've kind of given freely of your time. Uh, what, what, what could they do in return? I think the, the biggest ask that I have of anyone now uh, is stop questioning the science and stop being swayed by counterfactuals. Um, it's so tempting. Now, it can't be quite this bad. And, oh, there was a report the other day that said, oh, maybe the permafrost isn't quite as bad as you thought. 
it's very, very clear. There are, of course, nuances in the science uh, on species extinction and climate change, but the overall volume of scientific thought is so clear. And you don't even need the science anymore because it's, it's here. So when I started in this field, there used to be warning about what would be happening. And I used to mock up slides going, you know, global headlines will look like this one day. I don't have to mock them up now. I just send them today's news. And, um, you know, Siberia, unbelievable temperatures in the last week by any standard. Nothing seen like it since records began in the 1800s. Uh, we've all forgotten because of COVID, but Australia was on fire for six months recently. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, all these things, terrible flooding in Jakarta on New Year's Day, unbelievable, never seen rain like it. And, you know, it's so tempting to not confront the horror of where we've got to but we have got to a very, very dangerous place for the global climate. And what is happening right now in Siberia is proof of that. And if the permafrost goes, big, big problems. Um, you know, we haven't seen nothing yet. So I think follow the science, trust the science. And this is where I'm at one with Greta Thunberg. That is her core ask, is don't listen to me. Read the papers, read the IPCC report, read the peer-reviewed science. That's where we're at. And then. Whatever job you're in, whatever business you're in, whatever level you're in, ask what is the what is the most meaningful intervention that the company can make to be in tune with the science, because the science is not going to go away. Yeah, it's a, it's an extremely good. It's basically you know get involved mentally, uh, which I think few have done, and I it is quite scary. I just just hearing you there, I was thinking to myself how. Rapidly, we forget. You, you mentioned Australia. We lost an entire ice sheet. And we blinked for a bit, and I think most people kind of scratch their heads and try to remember when that happened. Um, mm-hmm. and certainly, I recall, you know, in the uh, 80s and 90s, people talking about uh, the permafrost, the Arctic ice scale, and it doesn't seem anything is sufficient to uh, to do it. Um, but social interaction seems to be making a difference at this point in time. Would you agree? It, it is, and COVID has helped a lot in that regard. I mean, the other thing about COVID is, you know, people have, you know, if you give people an hour a day where they're allowed to go out, people have really started to value public spaces, green spaces, as you say, quiet skies, uh, cleaner skies, you know, clearer skies. It's been very, very noticeable. And yeah, I mean, everyone was back on board the beach, you know, dumping litter everywhere uh, on Wednesday and Thursday this week. But it has given people a taste of what matters uh, and what doesn't matter. Um, but you're right. I mean, it's the same with smoking. You know, you can keep putting uh, warnings about and pictures of rotting lungs on cigarette packets. Some people still smoke. Uh, it's very difficult, the psychology. Of it, but, but the climate emergency is going to have such massive economic consequences that people are going to feel it in their wallet, even if they can't watch the picture of the ice sheet falling off. Brendan, you've generously uh, donated three quarters of uh, your time uh, to our audience to share your world. Uh, just a final uh, short question. The symbol for FS Club is a bull and a bear. Uh, somebody really representing optimism and pessimism. So what's your outlook, optimistic or pessimistic? Um, I am optimistic about some of it. Uh, so I, I'm optimistic that the current state of global politics is not sustainable uh, and that we will again see proper leadership away from this kind of infantile baby-like nationalism which has just wrecked uh, so much. Um, So I'm optimistic we will again get governments in place that really are willing and ready to tackle the climate emergency, these social fabric issues that we've talked about. Uh, I am quite pessimistic, though, about where the temperature rise in the world will stop. I don't think we're going to stabilize the climate at one and a half degrees. I don't think anybody really believes that's possible. Okay. We've it already. So if we did three, it would be quite good. But the consequences of three are pretty unpalatable. And I, you know, I feel very sad for my kids and their kids, the, the world they're going to inherit, because it's going to look nothing like what you and I grew up in. Well, I'm getting a, a reminder here in the nicest possible way. Please just pass on a big thank you to Brendan. Excellent conversation, Brendan, et cetera, which I will pass on to you afterwards. Uh, but for our audience, I'm, I'm sadly going to have to draw this to a close. Um, uh, before I thank you, Brendan, uh, I'd like to say, uh, firstly, thanks again to our sponsors, 
your tolerance is absolutely superb, uh, and we hope to uh, reward that with interesting conversations such as the one we've had now. Um, all of our sponsors are involved in areas of technology and finance and social purpose, so uh, please uh, do take it seriously. Um, secondly, I, I'd like to thank you, the audience. Uh, without you, uh, there would be no point in holding these things. Uh, so thanks for coming on and asking your questions. A quick look ahead uh, to next week uh, and the week beyond. We've got a fairly full program next week of four, uh, looking at employee share options. Um, related, I think, in many ways uh, to Brendan, uh, David Stephen, who works with Alex Evans, will be on talking about long crises. Uh, Alex has long been a proponent of getting a much more positive uh, NGO narrative out there. Uh, we've, we're going to have our green session on COP26 with Ben Caldecott. Uh, and then a fascinating bit, we're going to actually have the owner of City AM uh, this time next Friday uh, with Sheriff Chris Hayward, my fellow sheriff of the City of London. And finally, the following week, uh, Kathleen Tyson and Martin Watkins are going to be talking about CCPs and some of the, the deep plumbing of global finance and what might be rotten there. Uh, so all worth watching. But Brendan, it falls to me on behalf of the audience. One of the big drawbacks of these type of events is I can't open it up and show everybody applauding. But I do have my uh, traditional uh, Buddhist uh, uh, Buddhist uh, meditation device here to thank you in a somewhat traditional way. Uh, but I would genuinely like to thank you. It has been really wonderful to have you as ever. Uh, and we hope to see you back. And perhaps you can update us uh, next year on uh, some of the exciting things that you're doing at Roberts Bridge and uh, what's happening in the world of corporate social responsibility and ESG, which are really so important to all of us socially and to the planet. Thank you very much, Brendan. Thank you.